we're now really looking at how do you embrace and capture you know all of this power of the values that are wrapped up in the olympics and the partners that we have and put them to good good cause and good service in promoting the olympic movement and promoting the olympic ideals around the world uh, you're able to be far more selective in terms of the nature of the partners that you have so that it really is absolutely the right fit uh, and that everything we do is designed to you know enhance and strengthen the Olympic image and to take you know, the Olympic values to more and more people. But the huge sums of money now involved can lead to temptation. The Salt Lake City bribery scandal threatened the very foundations of the Olympic movement. Plutarch tells us that the all-conquering Roman armies looked upon the Olympic Games with contempt. They believed that young Greek men preferred to be nimble and handsome rather than be good soldiers and horsemen. The Games were regarded as a pagan festival and abolished by the Christian Roman Emperor Theodosius in 393 AD. The drama and spectacle of the ancient Olympic Games enriched Greek culture for over a thousand years. But gradually, during Roman times, their ideals were forgotten. Eventually, in 393 AD, the ancient Games died the Olympic tradition was almost lost forever. But the Games did return, with their ideals restated. The modern Olympic movement is now over a century old. The Olympic Games again enjoy the prestige they achieved in ancient Greek life. The founder of the modern games, Baron Pierre de Coubertin, died in 1937, aged 74, while walking by the shore of Lake Geneva in Switzerland. His considerable family fortune had been spent pursuing his Olympic vision. Coubertin's heart was buried at Olympia he would be gratified by the strength and spirit that prevails at the games of today. But the Salt Lake City bribery scandal, which exposed corruption at the core of the Olympic movement, would have hurt the founding father of the modern games. In late 1998, the International Olympic Committee the guardians of the flame of Olympic idealism was left fighting to save its reputation. The very future of the games was in question. Yes. Salt Lake City is evicted. Mr. Hodler, why did you appear at the press conference today? Were you told not to appear? Senior IOC member Mark Hodler shook the world of sport when he confirmed stories that several of his colleagues, in return for votes, were guilty of accepting gifts from cities bidding to host the games. Documents showed that the Salt Lake City Olympic Organizing Committee had bribed visiting IOC members, offering college scholarships, medical treatment, and free holidays in the hope of securing votes for their bid. The IOC launched an investigation into the allegations, as did the US Justice Department, the FBI, the US Olympic Committee, and the Salt Lake City organizers. Following the IOC's findings, four of its members resigned and a further 13 were required to provide explanations for their behavior. The Salt Lake City Olympic Committee president and senior vice president both resigned. Juan Antonio Samaranch was president of the IOC during the scandal. 
Desde la, en todas las crisis el mundo siempre... In all crises in the world, there is always a positive side. And you have to take advantage of this. The positive side in the crisis the Olympic movement suffered convinced the IOC members that this was an opportune moment to make a lot of changes. Changes which I might have attempted during my presidency were not achieved because for a member of the IOC who is elected for life, giving up his rights can be difficult. But this crisis showed that our institution needed a change to bring it up to date with modern times. He needed a sort of revolution. Reforms were quickly introduced. In March 1999, the IOC voted to expel six of its members who had been found guilty of accepting gifts or cash during the Salt Lake bid. A new host city bidding procedure was introduced for the 2006 Winter Games. An ethics commission was formed and the IOC 2000 commission was created to oversee reforms. The IOC has now banned member visits to potential host cities, limited the term of office of the IOC president, and obliged National Olympic committees to oversee and counsel the bidding cities in their countries. Athletes still competing, selected by their peers, have also been brought onto the IOC. Samaranch was able to assert that the IOC had cleaned the house. In 2001, Samaranch retired from the IOC's presidency after 21 years. His successor, the Belgian surgeon Jacques Rogger, faced the task of continuing to reform the Olympic movement and protect it from further corruption. We were tainted by a severe scandal because some of our colleagues did not respect the ethical rules. We went through a, a very difficult uh, period, but the IOC has been transformed totally from a rather conservative, uh, I would say, uh, well-meaning body, but clearly no more adapted to modern times. It has become, thanks to wise decisions, a modern, open, transparent and democratic structure. At the, uh, at the Recent circle, events may have tarnished the image of the Olympic Half movement, but for many years it has been working hard to provide help to those in need. You put left hand behind if you're catching it with the right. Okay, throw me a pass. I'm giving you the target. Okay, I'm catching with one hand and I'm throwing it back. And then I'm going to, as I get, as I master that, then I say, okay. The Olympic hard. Solidarity Program was founded in 1961 to provide aid to That's developing it. countries. It's like a well-oiled machine here, Dominicans. Coaching courses and seminars around the world offer advice and support at the grassroots of sport. I'm sure he was just doing it for the tape. Funding is provided by a share of Olympic television rights. Projects are now run in all five continents and support athletes, coaches, sports administrators, and ventures such as medical and environmental programs. The IOC hopes this will enable all countries to compete at the Games on a more equal basis. If we want to include the best and guarantee universality, the most important thing is to give assistance to all athletes and to ensure that they have the best opportunities to improve their chances of qualification. This is what we are doing for athletes from developing countries. At the moment, we have approximately 1,000 athletes from 120 countries who we are helping, and I hope that through our efforts, we can bring them to future Olympic Games. In addition to the Solidarity Programme, the 1994 Lillehammer Organising Committee created the Olympic Aid Programme. Athletes were chosen as ambassadors, led by four-time gold medalist Johann Olaf Koss, who spearheaded a fundraising campaign. A partnership was formed with the Red Cross, Save the Children Fund, 
and several Norwegian organizations to provide humanitarian support in war-torn countries and areas of distress. Since Olympic aid was founded, over $40 million have been raised, supporting schemes such as the Green Hills of Peace project in Rwanda. Following the destruction of civil war and genocide, children are now finding harmony through sport. You reach a level of play and joy and something which is totally different than has been done before. And I think it's uh, something everyone wants to do. If you have a, a for football, if you give a football to, to a child, they know exactly what to do with it. If you give a basketball, again, they know what to do with it. And they start interacting with them uh, and they start playing. It doesn't matter um, the differences they have between them. They will st start playing because it's fun and they don't really care what you believe in or what you're doing or what you have done. In 2003, Olympic Aid changed its name to Right to Play and became an independent organization, but maintained close links with the Olympic movement. The Solidarity Program now operates more than 10,000 activities, benefiting thousands of individuals. It has been over a hundred years since Pierre de Coubertin revived the Olympic Games. The current grandeur of his sporting legacy would have come as a shock to him. He may have disapproved of the commercialization of the Games, but would have to acknowledge its contribution to the present strength of the Olympic movement. The Coubertin's ambition was to ennoble and fortify sport, to ensure its independence, and place it in a position to fulfill its role in contemporary civilization. His vision and ideals still serve to inspire those who are the guardians of the flame. I think he'd be proud of what his successors have done of his tremendous legacy. He'd be surprised probably uh, by the changes. I'd be surprised by many things. But the very fundamental uh, values and ideas that he's defended and promoted around the world are still there. The modern Olympic Games are a remarkable legacy from the past and a beacon of hope for the future.